So thank you very much, Orca, and, and thank you also to SLU for this invitation um, to participate in this workshop and for the initiative as a whole. I think what I'll, I'll try to illustrate during my talk is that, particularly when we're looking at invasive uh, fungi, we really are at a point where we're starting to understand the magnitude um, of, of the problem that we face and how far we are from actually managing the problem and that we really need global alliance, alliances if we are going to successfully um, deal with, with the threats that these fungi pose to our <coughs> economic and our native systems. So, um, Oka asked earlier that we just introduce ourselves very quickly. So, I'm from the University of Pretoria, um, where I work in the Forestry and Agricultural Biotechnology Institute. And there are two programs that are of relevance to this talk, and those are uh, the a Tree Protection Cooperative Program and the Center for Excellence in Tree Health Biotechnology, the one which deals with our native trees and the other one with, um, with our commercial trees. And just also recognizing Martin Kemmler, a postdoc in the group who's very involved with this work, and Mike Wingfield, who is the director of this program. So just some perspective um, between South Africa and Sweden uh, to almost opposite sides of the world, very different in terms of the forestry resources. Also populations, you know, we have a, a much larger population, uh, tend to have a much drier environment with much smaller um, forest or tree resources, 1.8 million hectares um, in total versus the 24 million here in Sweden. But in both of these cases, of course, very, very valuable for us, but for different reasons. In our case, uh, a resource that is very vulnerable and needs um, care to protect and to provide in the fiber needs for the country. For that reason, a lot of the, the forestry activity is centered around, around plantations based on non-native species. And you see this faint green belt around here. It's a very intensive plantation forestry happening in that area. I'm just going to try and make my system here a little bit more efficient. So I don't have to jump up and down so much. There we go. Sorry about that. So getting to the threat that forest pathogens pose, or that, that fungal pathogens pose to these forests, it's of, invasive um, fungi pose to these forests, it's of course not a new thing. I could give you many examples. This of the magnific magnificent chestnut trees in the, in the United States that, that were dominant in uh, the forest there until um, an invasive pathogen called Cryphonic traparasitic was introduced and reduced those magnificent, magnificent trees to virtually nothing. And today, uh, they were, they're absent from these forests in terms of, do of dominant trees. And it's, it's phenomena that have been well studied and well known in terms of what drives such dramatic outbreaks, uh, in particular when new interactions occur. So these naive hosts are faced with a pathogen that they simply have no resistance to, or you have new traits evolving, either through hybridization of different fungi introduced into new areas and so forth. So very well understood what drives, what drives these, these patterns. And they're not confined to history. We see them popping out, um, up around the world <clears throat> continuously and with increasing frequency. This is a picture of Pinus radiata. These are plantations in Chile. Um, and just a few years ago, uh, started dying or, uh, in massive, at a massive scale. And it took quite a, a while to figure out that it was caused by Phytophthora species, completely unprecedented that these types of organisms would cause this type of disease um, on conifers. But since then, interestingly, similar diseases have been breaking out in the UK. Similar um, patterns are now being seen um, in New Zealand as well. And if we, if we look at, at a broader scale, this is an analysis that some of the people in the room have been involved in, analyzing patterns of these invasive fungal pathogens and their impact in forests in Europe, we see that, uh, that this, uh, the rate of these, these disease outbreaks, the rate of the invasions, are increasing uh, with a dramatic rate in recent years. Similarly, pointed out in this paper, where they analyzed more broadly, uh, globally, fun fungal threats to animals, plant, and, and other ecosystems, and showing this very rapid increase in these emerging diseases on, on plants caused by invasive 
um, invasive organisms. And the reasons for those are also fairly well understood. In this paper, um, written by Jeff Garnes and, and Brett and I were also involved, we were looking at, at pests, so insects, um, in, in the context of biological control, but the same is true for the fungal pathogens. There seems to be this, with it, at least within the plantation environments where we work, a, ho a homogenization of these pests, driven by various factors, you know, the, the rapidly increasing uh, trade and transport, hundreds of millions of containers moving around the world with inspection rates of 1 to, one to 5 percent. This is a, a ship destined for Japan, filled to the brim with freshly cut pine logs containing all kinds of organisms. There, um, there are, of course, uh, treatments for that, but one wonders how efficient that can be at a scale, at a scale like this. But also things like, for example, this global homogenization of our environments. More and more of the same species being planted globally, invasive plants also homogenizing our environments and becoming stepping stones um, for these invasive fungi to get a foothold. So really well und underst understood patterns. So reflecting on what Mark was saying in, in his uh, talk in terms of where we focus our effort to control it, either pre-entry or post-entry, really when it comes to the fungi, we have to focus our efforts on, on the pre-entry. Once the fungi are established and start moving, it's virtually impossible to do anything um, about them. Or very, very difficult. So there's a, a general agreement that we need to understand the pathways by which these fungi are moving around the world. And in this um, recent paper by um, Sandy Leopold and others, they analyzed one of these pathways in particular, and that is live plant imports. And I'm putting it up here to illustrate the magnitude of the problem and perhaps some of the things that are behind those rising patterns um, of invasive fungal um, pathogens that I showed in previous slides. So these are numbers of live plants imported into the U.S. The red line indicating the import value going up above 600 million U.S. dollars a year. And the numbers here above 3 billion live plants that are imported into the U.S. annually. And they analyze within this paper very nicely the efficiency with which such numbers really can be inspected. Um, and, and, it, and as one can imagine, it's very, very low. But then showing, if they look at historical records, the damaging insects and fungi that have been introduced in the U.S., more than 70% of them are likely used this pathway. So if we consider that, um, if um, Mark's suggestion of um, using our current patterns and predicting towards the future, they, this really does not, um, hold or, or spells uh, a very bad picture for the fungi that might affect our forests um, and other plant ecosystems. And that's what's behind a, a declaration with, that was made uh, in 2011 called the Maltes Claris Declaration, and here promoted by the International Union of Forestry Research Organizations, EUFRO, saying that they are very worried about this pattern and calling for a phasing out of all tra trade in plant and plant products. Really um, an unrealistic uh, request or un unrealistic suggestion, but illustrating the magnitude of the concern that, that are behind this. Or, uh, concern that, um, about what, is, what we're observing within our forest systems. So what I want to do for the, for the remainder of this talk is have that as a background. The, we, we know that these numbers are rising very dramatically, but then argue that even, um, even though we can draw those graphs now, there is, there is a vast underestimation of the magnitude and the scale with which this is happening and that we are uh, really only at the beginning of, uh, of applying tools that can, start, that can help us define that risk and help us find uh, ways that we can manage that, that risk. So I'll run through three broad themes. The one is the scale and the cryptic nature of these diversities and what that holds for understanding their invasion patterns, the complexity and magnitude of fungal diversity, and how are we going to get a handle on this that we can move towards management? <clears throat> so if I look at the scale and cryptic nature of fungal diversity, one of the 
very first uh, papers I ever published was this one that looked at a fungus associated with an invasive um, wasp. And I found that everywhere in the southern hemisphere, it was virtually a clone. Everything looked more or less the same. And I thought at that stage, that that, that was 2001, that that reflected very, you know, what many of these fungal invasions look like. There's a single introduction that gets established, and you have these very uniform um, populations. But we've seen a completely pic different picture in most other systems that we've studied. I'll just give two examples here. This one is the Plodia pinea. You can see uh, the, the, the disease it causes on pine. And every one of these pies is a population that was studied and looking at the number of genotypes. So what's relevant here is this is a, an asexually reproducing fungus. The only way that this uh, amount of diversity can occur within the country is if there have been numerous or at least very, very large introductions of these fungi over time. The same for this, for this fungus. Uh, it's a fungus infecting eucalyptus. And I'm not going into the details of what this means. It's just the many different genotypes that you find there, an asexually reproducing fungus um, or clonally reproducing fungus, and just massive diversity that must have been introduced many, many times. In both of these cases, these fungi must have come with plant material. This, these are not things that are blown in the air and, and um, moved there by themselves. Again, um, and, and I, a point that I, that I skipped over or forgot to make when I was looking at those, those rising patterns of invasive fungi is that those patterns are based on assessments of disease outbreaks. We have absolutely no idea um, of what has been moved or are already established in our environments that are not causing disease at that scale. Here we're getting a sense of some of what might be happening. We were doing, and I'll make some sense of the, of the trees for you just now, we were doing surveys in rivers, or at, at one river system um, in the Gauteng province where uh, we are based, looking for Phytophthora species. Phytophthora species are really important, uh, typically um, uh, root pathogens of, of plants, and found uh, something quite disturbing, quite a bit of diversity there, but also some hybrids, and you, hybrids of these Phytophthora species. So what is illustrated here is you see this group here marked in green. And if you look at the nuclear genes, you see it's split between two completely different clades. Here is in one clade. The orange group there uh, split between two completely different clades. So these are hybrids between different species of Phytophthora. The concerning thing with this is these exact same hybrids occur in river systems in Western Australia. So not only are we introducing species, we, we're even introducing uh, the hybrids that uh, is a consequence, most likely, of invasion in Western Australia, here being introduced into South Africa. If we, if we then consider what, this, what does it mean if we're introducing this level of diversity and we reflect on uh, work that's done with plants and animals, it's very well established um, that introducing more such diversity really increases the ability of these organisms to, to adapt to environments and to invade these environments. So it really has serious consequences. I want to, um, for a part of the talk now, focus on a particular group of organisms that I work with. They're called the Botrysferiaceae, and they are amongst the most common and widespread pathogens in agriculture and forestry systems. They more or less infect all uh, the woody plants that you see around you. You'll find them there, and you'll find them inside the healthy plants. They're endophytic. They don't cause disease symptoms for the most part of the infection, except when the plants are under stress. Then they start causing typical decline diseases with diebacks and cankers that emerge on the, on the plants. It's important to remember that they spread through rain and wind, so spread between continents really has to be human-assisted. And uh, where they start causing the problems is when the plants are under stress. And for that reason, they also very important within the context of climate change. And we're already seeing cases where there are extreme heat waves in Europe, and you see large uh, forests being affected by these, by these pathogens. And I want to reflect on um, where we are in terms of understanding the diversity of these and the invasive patterns of these organisms. I started off my career doing taxonomy on, uh, on these organisms. Um, and it's a really fascinating fascinating thing to do. You dig into these 
150 year old papers, try and figure out what the Latin means and what the person was trying to describe, to try and, in this case, find a new type, a new living or a new, new specimen from which we could get a living culture to define this particular species. It took us three years to do that, and in the end we realized that that's on this little branch here, what really is the real Botosphere, the Thidia, and what has been included into the species before is just a vast diversity of fungi. It's not one fungus, it's many, many different fungi. In fact, if we look at just one of the groups that was within this, this called New Physicocum rebus parvum clade, and we look within our native environment, and we start isolating this and using the most uh, uh, powerful molecular tools that we have, even that little clade within that contains at least five different cryptic species. So a lot of diversity that previously was just packaged into a particular name. So we could, because our, our systems, uh, the, these old systems of uh, the, that, those descriptions I was showing you are simply inadequate to now describe these species, we turned to using the molecular characters to now give names to this. It still took us a few years to do, uh, uh, and then that's the point I want to make with this, is this is an inc incredibly slow and cumbersome process to define this diversity. We then use that information to now try and understand the invasion pathways of just one of these cryptic species, New Physicocum parvum. And the, 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 the title of the paper was The Challenge of Understanding the Origin Pathways and Extent of These Fungal Invasions, because it became almost intractable to figure out where is this fungus native um, and where, ha where has it been introduced. So we could look at worldwide diversity, find many of these lineages, and if you zoom in on some of those lineages, there's just no geographical pattern there. It's just everything is more or less everywhere of a fungus that really should be geographically um, defined based on its natural way of spread. We could also start seeing that some of these uh, appear to be more, uh, some more invasive than others. So if we look across sites in South Africa, this particular species, New Physicocum parvum, is the one that we find most widespread in the world but also popping up at all of these blue star sites in our um, city or disturbed environments. If you look in the native um, conserved environments, you don't find the species. So starting to finally make sense of which of these species are invasive in these environments and which not. But looking at, at uh, the system that we work with here a lot, the eucalyptus system, we started to realize that many of these fungi also originate from our native plants and move on to the eucalyptus and vice versa. So where we were originally working with just Botrysweria dethidia on the eucalyptus, we now have 23 different species on, on this particular host. And if I zoom in on one new Physicocum eucalyptorum that we're pretty sure is native to eucalyptus in Australia, we start seeing it now in Chile, in South Africa, and in Uruguay, and in Uruguay also on their native metaceae. The same if we look at, at native plants in South Africa, such as the acacia species, we start dissecting the diversity that's there. So these are all different species that we now find on that. And every one of these with stars are species that you can find more or less everywhere in the world. So in our, and, and uh, unfortunately that's very faint there, but this is now sampling these native plants in very remote areas in, in South Africa and showing that a, uh, a large proportion of the diversity on them did not originate in this area. So, so I want with that, uh, wanted with that to sketch for you something of the cryptic nature of, of these invasions and how difficult it is to, to track them. And I want to now take a next step and reflect on the complexity of these fungal communities, because looking at them at an, in an individual scale like I just did is also not the whole picture. And helping us make sense of the, the complete diversity of these fungal communities is this in, incredible di um, development in terms of next generation sequencing. This is a graph showing you this massive drop after 2007 in sequencing costs, which has just driven uh, an explosion in what are called next generation sequencing technologies. And what this is allowing us to do is characterize whole fungal communities and not only zoom in on specific groups. 
I have, I have one more slide here. Um, yeah, it, it comes from the McKinsey Global Institute, analyzing uh, disruptive technologies for the future and listing next generation genomics in position number seven there. And it certainly is doing that in terms of our understanding of fungal communities. Let me give you an illustration of that. So if we look at healthy eucalyptus plants, we know that these Botrysoriaceae and many others can infect these plants and live within their healthy tissue as endophytic infections. So we typically used to isolate these fungi and go through the process of identifying them, which is more or less what I've described to you up to now. What we can now with the next generation sequencing do is directly take the DNA and in parallel characterize all the diversity that's there. So what it shows us is if we take the culturing approach and we, we try to be as complete as we can, we get to 75 different operational taxonomic units, so uh, individual units within a, a, a healthy eucalyptus tree. But then going through some of these next generation sequencing technologies, you can now see that we, instead of working with maybe four or 500 different sequences, we, you can now do almost 10,000 in parallel. The number of operational taxonomic units just increases massively. And you can take this up to, there are technologies now that will give you billions of these weeds. And our numbers keep, just keep increasing. These, co these communities are incredibly complex and much, much more complex than what we've ever imagined. So what are some of the things that we're starting to learn from these technologies? Well, here we're comparing the diversity in a comparable sample between eucalyptus and our native Sazigium samples. And you see a massive difference in this introduced tree and the diversity that's within that versus the diversity that's within the native tree. Um, and I'm, I'm just pointing out patterns here. These are patterns that the, the mechanisms behind them we, we simply don't understand. You don't need to know all the detail here. If you look at the, those, th those three parts of the pies, you'll see that those are clearly the dominant fungi. I'll just point out that, well, the top half of this, so, so let's say the purple and the blue, are called the Microsoriaceae and the Teratosoriaceae. These are, are fungi that we know are pathogens, or they're typically thought of as pathogens. We never thought of them as dominant parts of the endophytic community. They're completely dominant of this environment. More than 50% of the diversity that's there are within these groups. And the simple reason is that if you isolate them, they grow like a centimeter in a month, whereas the other fungi fill your plate in three days. So it's just a matter of our, our tools were ineffective to, to define them. We took the Teratosoriaceae that emerged from, from this study, put it into a phylogenetic framework to see whether what we're finding as endophytes, how they correlate to the pathogens. So the pathogens you see here in black, the orange ones are what comes from these environmental samples, these endophytic samples. And what it shows is that many of these endophytes are very closely related to the pathogen groups. They, they're really very closely related. But it also shows you a massive amount of diversity that we ha simply have no taxonomic handle on. We don't know where they fit in, um, and they, they are, there's no way to consistently work with them. We're learning uh, other things about these communities. So in this, other important things in terms of understanding invasion in terms of these endophytic communities. So this study, is, it's not one that I've been involved in. They looked at uh, a specific tree, a uh, species that grows in Europe and in Japan. It's native in Japan. They looked in two different areas, a native a rural and native urban area in Japan and also an urban and rural area in France, if I remember correctly, and looked at these communi communities. So that's the representation of the community in Japan and the community within, within Europe. So these endophytic communities, so you've got one tree species, and they seem um, completely different in these two different environments. And what it says is that really, if you take a tree from where it is native and you plant it somewhere else, it will acquire the endophytes um, that is within that environment. <clears throat> but we've gone a step further, so th that, that to some extent we, we expected, but then took five different studies, so this is M Martin Kemmler's work that I mentioned in the beginning, five different studies that looked at total communities within um, a, a number of plant species in different parts of the world. So here we have the US, France, uh, so this, this, yeah, uh, also the US, South Africa, and Hawaii. 
so spread across the world, and looked at the similarity between these communities. We found the same pattern that was in the previous study, that geographically these things are very clearly defined, but then zoomed in on the part of the community that did overlap, where, they, where, there, were, where there was overlap. And we're amazed to find that the similarities between these, despite their geographic distance, match the phylogenetic pattern, phylogenetic relationship of the host. So what this really tells us is that these, these inner city communities, even though they, they will occupy or they will infect whatever host you put within that environment, there are phylogenetically related mechanisms, so co-evolution between these groups that really shape the structure of these communities. So I wanted with that to just sketch with you, to you a picture of the kind of complexity that we're dealing with within these communities and reflecting on the numbers of plants that, we, that is being imported in the, into the US, live plants, containing all of this diversity. Every time we're moving these plants between world regions, we're moving all of these communities with them. Um, I've also sketched a picture for you for, uh, of our current taxonomic systems, and hopefully you get a sense of, of how inadequate they are at the moment to get a handle on that kind of diversity. To just drive home that, um, that, that point, a few years ago we uh, tried to estimate how many fungi might there be in, um, in southern Africa, and this is a a little bit of a hand-waving exercise. There are many estimates of fungi around the world that varies from one and a half million to 10 million species. So here we came up with a number of 171,000 species and we thought that that was fairly conservative for the region. So if you match that to the, the current rates of description, it would take us another 6,000 years to describe that. And that, of course, is, is not only for fungi, but in particularly relevant to fungi. And in this paper, um, Madison and others reflect on a new type of taxonomy that is needed to ramp up biodiversity discovery. Um, where the old method, this is a completely closed process, so somebody discovers something, ponders on it for many years, goes through the old records, and eventually it gets published and then is known to the scientific community. They propose a method where, um, where data is made available to the community um, um, right up front, and that the community can start adding information to that process. How much? Ten. We've got ten left. We're doing fine. So that the community can Im immediately start adding information to, uh, to that discovery, but also start using the information that comes from it, to a point where you, you put a specific tag um, on that uh, species hypothesis, and move throughout this accumulation of, of information towards a process where you eventually describe it. So you end up at the same process. But in the, in, in the meantime, you get A, the, the, imp the input from the community, but you also make this inv information available to them um, in a tractable way to do. Is this possible with, within the fungi? Um, it, it is becoming possible to do so, and in fact it is starting to happen. So the description of these fungi or putting handles on, these, on this diversity is governed by this international code of, of nomenclature combined with the, with the, with the plants. So they're in, in the same code. And recent, a number of recent changes have relevance to this. One being, for example, that the, fun, the fung fungi used to have different names for their asexual and their sexual states. That has been disbanded. That, that's a big step forward for this process. It used to require that you have to write your description in Latin and that you have to publish it on a piece of paper, which is absolutely unthinkable in this day and age and given these challenges that we, that we face. That has been disbanded now and this counts as a formal description of a species now. So published electronically and, and no longer um, uh, in, in Latin and using the genetic information that is available. So we really are, I think, at, a, at, at the stage where, where fungal taxonomy can start, of, uh, can start to um, provide the tools that will allow us to deal with the magnitude of the threats that we're facing. And one of the most recent initiatives, and, and, sorry, what I also just wanted to add here is one of, the, one of the 
points that um, Hibbert and Taylor makes in this paper is that one of our biggest needs is to start a process by which we can put a formal handle on things that we discover within the environment that, uh, that is only known from sequence, so these environmentally identified um, sequences. And that is starting to happen, and, and uh, people at SLU um, also inv uh, involved in this initiative and driven to a large extent here out of Scandinavia where they've taken a database of sequences that used to focus on mycorrhizal fungi and are now focusing those resources much more broadly through a process where the community can now start participating in annotating sequences that are there where um, they are starting, they're introducing a new term called species hypothesis. So a, a label that will be added to a particularly defined group and that would be linked to that group as it goes forward. Community can now start adding the information exactly as has been ima imagined by Madison and others um, to start defining um, the units that we're working with. So to conclude, the fungal invasions, most of the, the data that we have at the moment is concerning, but it's based on these disease outbreaks, most of it. And I hope, uh, and, it's, and it's rising, these numbers, just based on that data, is rising all around the world. But I hope I've given you a sense that the real extent of these invasions is significantly greater than what is reflected within those records. Um, I hope I've given you some examples of how barcoding and whole community analysis um, can help us unravel the complexity of these, of these fungal communities. So we, these tools are now available. And that we really would need uh, these whole community barcoding to really understand the magnitude of the problem that we faced. But it will have to be based on curated database. That's this initiative that I've just talked about. Based on these, we can start uh, to think about proper monitoring of invasive fungi, including plant pathogens. So we really, I, I think, at, at, a, at a phase where we um, can start get a to get a handle on the extent and start to base our management practices on that. But it will require an incredible investment in terms of time and, f and finances, taxonomic expertise. The role for tax taxonomists are not decreasing, but really increasing to give meaning to these curated database and global cooperation. And this simply is not something that any particular country has the capacity to, do, to deal with. The tools are there. And with those tools, and, and, and if we can get the community behind these efforts, then I really believe that there's a new era uh, in front of us in terms of fungal biogeography um, and understanding the ecology at these, these larger scales, um, which I think holds a lot of promise to better characterize the extent of these fungal invasions and based on management on, on solid evidence. I want to um, end with this image, which I, I see the reference is gone. It comes from an opinion piece in Nature and shows the, it, it reflects on the growth of collaboration um, around the world. And you can maybe reflect on Mark's picture with, uh, with, the, with the planes. But I think this is what, what is, what for me is ins inspiring about this is if it, it's a bit of a gloomy picture to look at these, the rise of these fungal invasions around the world. It's nice that it is matched by these growing global connections in terms of research collaboration. And I really believe that this is central to us actually dealing with the consequences and the threats of these invasions. Thank you.